her way. Fox, NBC, CBS, 
PBS, whatever they're called, BBC. But right from birth, you know, we go to these 12 year prison sentences to indoctrination camps, and they teach us uh, that the government is good, and they basically don't teach us. The one thing they don't teach us is how to think. And they do that on purpose, because if we thought, then we wouldn't want these governments. So, everything around us is actually quite unreal. So the schools are indoctrination camps. Uh, they tell us that democracy is uh, a good thing. Democracy is slavery. We just choose our own dictator every four years. You know, Mitt Romney or Barack Obama? Come on. <laughs> uh, they teach us that taxation isn't theft, right? It, of course it's theft. Anyone try not to pay their taxes recently? And they, they tell us that uh, the government here is here to protect us. Well, I've been to that guy in the middle there a few times. <laughs> it's not really here to protect us. It's here to protect the status quo. So, really what we're living in today is Truman's world. Uh, you here today, because you're here, you probably know this, but all those people outside, hardly anyone knows it. And people don't even want to know. My own father actually told me when I talked about these things, he said, I don't want to know. People don't want to know these things, but it's, it's, it's important because we live in a fantasy land right now. Uh, ever since the dollar was uh, taken away from gold, uh, we've been in a complete fantasy land debt bubble world. And it's all about to collapse. And let's talk about why. Now, if you want to kill the dollar. If, you, if your plan actually was to kill the dollar, these are the four easy steps to do so. Democracy would be the first step, central banking would be the second step, fiat currency would be the third step, and that will lead to government debt. And let's go through those. Democracy. <coughs> Alexander Titler said that a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until a majority of the people discover that they can vote themselves largesse out of the public treasury. And that's exactly where we're at today. Let's look at the U.S. This is the Heritage Foundation Dependency Index. So in 1962, it was at 19. This is, these are people that are dependent on the government for their livelihood. It's gone up tenfold since the 1960s. It's now, it's, actually, I haven't updated this chart. It's actually gone up since that uh, down spike during uh, 2009, 2008. It's actually closer to 300 right now. So it's gone up more than tenfold. These are people dependent on the government. These are the people that, uh, the percentage of the U.S. population living in a household receiving some government benefits is almost at 50% right now. So when you have a democracy and half the population is living off the other half of the population, this is the death knell. This is the end of democracy. And it's actually a natural thing. This is always where democracy will end up when you can actually vote yourself uh, theft from other people to give to yourself. And the U.S. right now is at the 50% mark. So this is the end of the U.S. democracy. It's actually already over, but uh, they're playing the game a little bit longer right now. Now, secondly, you take the Federal Reserve. What's the supposed mandate of the Federal Reserve? They say they're supposed to keep the purchasing power of the currency stable and to promote full employment. Well, let's just look. Even if you think central banking, for whatever reason, might have some value, to society as a whole. Let's look at what they say they're supposed to do. Here's the unemployment rate. This is actually from uh, shadowstats.com. I don't know if anyone knows that, this site. They actually just track the unemployment, or actually all government statistics, the way they used to track them in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, so this is the way the uh, US government used to track unemployment before Bill Clinton and all those people learned how to take all the unemployment out of the unemployment figures. So the top blue rate is actually the way they used to calculate, calculate unemployment. It's actually near 25% right now. Now I know they're talking about in the media, oh, it, the unemployment rate's down to 8.3% or something. It's, it's all massaging of statistics. They actually took one million people out of the employable people category from December to January. That's all they did. So that top blue blue number is just the way they used to calculate unemployment. It's actually near 23%, which is pretty close to where it was in the depression levels. 
and we're in a depression right now. You don't realize it because we're in a hyperinflation, or not hyperinflationary, but soon to be hyperinflationary. It's an inflationary depression. So the second thing that the uh, Federal Reserve says that they're supposed to do is protect the value of the dollar. Well, let's look at their track record. The 98 years before the Federal Reserve was founded, the dollar lost 0% of its value. It was actually basically backed by gold at that point. In the 98 years since the Federal Reserve, it's lost about 98% of its value. So, what is the purpose of this central bank? What do they do? They actually just create destruction, they impoverish people, they transfer wealth, and they basically just destroy economies. It's actually a very communist system. So, when you have democracy and then you have Federal Reserve or central banking, what's the last thing you could possibly do to destroy the dollar? I don't know if you have sound here. Let's see if you have sound. Do you have any sound, Mr. Sound person? Maybe not. I'll tell you what he's saying. He's basically saying, in this 1971, August 15th, uh, Richard Nixon is saying, they have to remove the gold backing from the dollar to protect it from currency speculators, and it's going to be temporary. And actually, I agree, it's going to be temporary, and we're nearing the end of that soon. <laughs> he was right. So, based on democracy, central banking, fiat currency, here's where we are today. This is the U.S. government debt. Now, this is the debt that they admit to. So, over 15 trillion right now. This, uh, you can't even update these charts fast enough to keep up with all this stuff. This chart is like about uh, six months old and it's a trillion dollars behind. Uh, but this is, this is where we're at. And this is what happens when you have democracy, central banking, fiat currency. But that's not even the true story. This is the total amount of admitted debt of the U.S. government. This is the total amount of U.S. federal government debt and liabilities calculated under generally accepted accounting principles, which is what every company in the U.S. has to adhere to. If the U.S. government adhered to it, the total amount of debt and liabilities of the U.S. government would be over $75 trillion. And that's because they don't include Social Security. They actually include it as income. And then they spend it right away in Medicare, Medicaid, and all those things. So the total amount of debt is 75 trillion. So if you have a calculator that can do numbers big enough, which is actually difficult, you can actually figure out the total amount. So it's really hard to actually visualize this amount of debt. So this is $100 bills, and this is $100 million. Those are $100 bills. This is $1 billion in $100 bills. That's $1 trillion in $100 bills. This is the total amount of admitted to debt of the U.S. federal government. It's getting very hard to see that initial pallet now. That's the admitted part. And this is the total actual, if you accounted for it properly, debt liabilities of the U.S. government. The one on the right. And you can't actually see that pallet on, on the, you can't, you can't even see it anymore. That's, that's what it looks like visualized. Now if you have a calculator that's big enough, 75 trillion divided by 300 million people is about $250,000 per person. So family of four has about a million dollars of federal government debt and liability overhanging them. And they've basically been living on that now for the last 30, 40 years. So this is completely unsustainable. There's no way this is payable. So, really, at this point, the U.S. government has three options. They can inflate, which will turn into hyperinflation, which is what they're doing right now. They can default on the promised benefits to the citizenry, which would mean just saying Social Security doesn't exist, welfare doesn't exist, pensions don't exist, government pensions. That won't go over very well, especially with this crowd, probably, or the people in Palm Springs that I've seen so far. <laughs> or outright default on interest and debt. Uh, which will also have its own implications. It'll, basically, all these options are nuclear options. And that's the only options that are left at this point. And we're getting very close to it. I give it no longer than a few more years, no more than five more years, until one of these things has to happen. Now, as long as this guy is the chairman of the Federal Reserve, <laughs> we're headed for hyperinflation. And this has happened countless times in history, dozens of times. Argentina, Zimbabwe, Germany, 
Almost every country, actually. Even in the U.S., it's defaulted numerous times. Not, not many people realize that. In, uh, they defaulted in 1933 when they took away the gold backing from the dollar and they uh, revalued gold. Uh, 1971 was also a default. Uh, but those were manageable defaults. We're now getting to the point where it's not manageable anymore. So really, what we have to do now is look at how we protect ourselves. So let's look at protecting our assets. Like I said earlier, precious metals, and really important is geopolitical diversification. We'll talk about that a little bit. Now, I used to get this question all the time. I don't get it too much anymore. People would say, well, I think the U.S. dollar will collapse over the next few years. Uh, perhaps I should put my money into other fiat currencies, maybe the Swiss franc or the Canadian dollar. Well, the Swiss franc was always the thorn in my side a little bit. I would always say, yeah, you're kind of right. The Swiss franc is a little bit better than all the other currencies. Well, that all changed. That changed this year when the Swiss franc devalued. And uh, just like every democracy on earth, they were under pressure from their exporters, and the exporters wanted the uh, currency to value. That's exactly what happened. This is the Swiss franc money supply. Uh, it's gone up from, well, it's basically gone up threefold in a matter of a, like a week. Uh, so the Swiss franc has decided to commit suicide alongside the euro. So, should you buy Swiss francs? No. Now, I get this a lot too. I'm actually originally from Canada. Uh, should we buy Canadian dollars? Oh, they, it's a commodity currency, right? Well, let's look at the Canadian dollar. This is the Canadian dollar money supply, that red line. It's exactly the same as the US dollar. And that's the purchasing power of the Canadian dollar uh, going down, almost at exactly the same rate as the uh, US dollar. The, the Bank of Canada has done exactly the same thing as the Federal Reserve. There's really no difference. And not many people realize uh, that, first of all, that Canada also has a lot of debt. The total amount of debt per person in Canada is $71,000 per person. It's a lot better than the U.S. Canadians are always a little bit, you know, I don't know what to say, like, what the word would be. They're not quite as bad as Americans, uh, but uh, uh, still, 71000 So it's actually $300,000 per family of four of federal government debt in Canada. But what's really backing the Canadian dollar? This is the total Bank of Canada Reserve. So if you think the U.S. dollar is going to collapse, should you buy the Canadian dollar? Well, what backs the Canadian dollar? These are the Bank of Canada Reserves. U.S. dollar is almost completely backed the Canadian dollar. The one on the right is the amount of gold backing the Canadian dollar. Not many people know this. Hardly anyone knows this. Even Canadians don't know this. That there's hardly any gold backing the Canadian dollar. The, the uh, uh, Canadian government sold all of it in the 1980s. I actually did a, a uh, to scale to show you the total amount of gold back in the Canadian dollar. This is the uh, prime murder of Canada, Stephen Harper. And uh, that's actually what it would look like. That's the total amount of gold back in the Canadian dollar. And he might have that in his closet for all I know. He could probably put it in his closet. That's the total amount of gold back in the Canadian dollar. So if the U.S. dollar collapses, uh, I wouldn't look to the Canadian dollar for refuge. 90% of the Canadian economy is actually with the U.S. So as the U.S. collapses, the Canadian uh, economy will collapse and so will the Canadian dollar. So, how do you protect yourself? Well, hard assets. Whatever Ben Bernanke can print is a pretty good investment for the next few years. <coughs> so, you, I actually look, invest in gold uh, for, and silver bullion for safety. That's the way I look at it, and I invest in the, in the lovely companies that are here at this conference uh, for profit. Now, it hasn't worked out that way for the last few years. It's been uh, unusual, but that's generally how I look at it. So here's the price of gold for the last 10 years, and a lot of people might say, well, that looks pretty crazy. It's, it must be nearing an end, so, you know, it's been 10 years almost going up. But let's look at it really. You know, you look, if you actually pay attention, and please don't watch CNBC or any of those things. They're all propaganda. Uh, they will all say that gold and silver is in a bubble. It's totally not in a bubble, and let's go through that. This is the gold price in nominal U.S. dollar terms. So the top one is in dollars. And, yeah, if you looked at that objectively, you would say, well, that looks pretty crazy. It looks like it's hyperbolic. It looks... Uh, like it might be near an end soon, but those bottom two lines are adjusted for inflation since 1970. 
So the, the second line, the, the sort of uh, top second line, is actually adjusted just by the government's CPI number. And the bottom line is actually adjusted by the shadow stat CPI number, which I think is a better, better gauge of inflation, even though neither of them are very good. But those bottom two charts are actually the real chart of the real price of gold. So it looks like it's actually been in a fairly horrible bear market for 40 years, or at least 30 years since uh, 1980. Same thing for silver. This is the silver chart adjusted for inflation. The top line is in dollars. So again, don't look at the price of precious metals in terms of dollars. You'll get completely thrown off because they're printing these things at will. They're abstract things at this point. There's, there's no point in even looking at things in terms of dollars. Those bottom two lines are the silver price adjusted for inflation. By the government's own numbers, or by an even better number, but either one, it looks like a complete bear market. So we're very early into any sort of gold or silver in the bull market. I took the price of things since the 1980s. On the right side, you can see a new car used to cost about seven thousand, now cost about twenty-eight thousand. Uh, a dozen eggs used to cost a dollar, now cost about three dollars. Uh, a gallon of gas used to cost about a dollar, now cost four dollars. On the left is gold and silver. I took eight hundred dollar gold, so it's basically gone up about two hundred percent in the last thirty years. Silver, I took a fifteen dollars. I didn't take the uh, Hunt Brothers uh, peak in 1980, but still, it's probably gone up about 200% since 1980. So, when people try to tell you that gold and silver are in a bubble, remember this. They are actually the, the smallest ones on this chart. It's only actually one thing that sticks out on this chart. That's the middle one sticking out like the middle finger. That's the U.S. federal government debt. In 1980, it was $0.9 trillion. Dollars. It's now over $15 trillion. Dollars. That's the bubble. The bubble is in government debt. So, how can you profit from this? And I think a good way is to pull the silver stocks. And I invest in a lot of these companies that are here. This is a chart, not in dollars, but in terms of gold, of the HUI, the uh, gold bus index. So these are basically the uh, gold uh, major stocks uh, since 2000. But it's not in terms of dollars, it's in terms of gold, which is how I try to look at everything, because you can't look in terms of dollars or you'll get completely confused. And really, gold stocks are still trading at the same level they were trading at vis-a-vis -vis gold in 2003 when gold was $350 an ounce. They have not gone up at all. So actually, the gold stocks have actually underperformed the volume. So I believe that these stocks are due for a major revaluation. And I think we're going to go into a bubble, a bubble into a mania. We'll talk a bit about that. About that. Uh, this is uh, my analyst. This is an interesting story. I, um, I'm not a gold stock analyst, a gold money analyst. When I go around and look at these booths, they show me rocks. It doesn't mean anything to me. It looks like just a rock with shiny stuff in it. But um, uh, what I realized was I needed a gold money analyst. And I actually found a, a guy. His name is Ed Bugos. He's our analyst. And in 1999, he was actually a uh, broker. And he told all of his clients to get out of tech stocks in 1999 right before the tech bubble crash. Then he went on and he started a gold stock newsletter with a company called Adora, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, and he told all of his readers to sell gold stocks in 2007. This is a chart of the TSX Venture Exchange, which is a pretty good proxy for junior gold mining stocks. And uh, if anyone was involved or only stocks in 2008, they will remember they're actually scarred for life from this. That was the worst bear market in history, as far as I know, I've never seen anything worse than that. Uh, Ed Bugos told everyone to sell before that, and not because he follows the money economics, he follows the money supply, those sort of things. And uh, so this is our analyst, and he actually today does not think we're headed towards a uh, major crash like that, at least not this year, maybe next year, not this year. So that's our analyst. And I asked Ed to give us a few stocks. If anyone here invests in stocks, these are a few of our favorites. He likes Amarillo Gold, which is ADC on the venture. Eurasia Minerals, which I believe is here. Uh, EMX on the venture. Maris Gold, which is in Africa. 
MXI on the venture. This is all venture exchange, which is actually where we think the real value is. And uh, premium exploration is a real exploration stock, PEM on the venture. So those are uh, four of our stocks that we really like. And I believe the only one that's here is Eurasian. Um, so check them out. They're actually excellent. Eurasian has over 200 properties. It's amazing. They get everyone else to pay for the property. It's really like owning a uh, mutual fund of junior exploration stocks all within one company. So it's an excellent one to look at. This is something I wanted to mention. If you own stocks, not many people know this. When your broker registers the shares, well, they actually don't register the shares. They register them in something called street form. Which means you don't not, you're not the actual legal owner of those shares. So if you have a number of gold stocks in your portfolio at some brokerage, you don't actually own them. Not many people know that. And the reason this is important is because I think with the coming financial crisis that we're already in, uh, things like MF Global, which already collapsed, these things are going to happen all the time now. Uh, if your brokerage collapses, or those bank accounts, your stocks will go with it. They're considered their assets because they're not registered in your name. This is a report we wrote.